All right, Jesse on Fire, welcome back to the channel. So we are going to talk about the Chandler and Ferguson fight again really quick because we're going to talk about that. Now we're going to talk about the aftermath and uh, what Chandler's setting up with the Connor fight that is, is, is kind of like in the work. And in general, I need to do a video about this because I talked about it a little bit on my live stream last night when I was wasted at like 1.30 in the morning. And I, I, I didn't do just, there's a million points I need to make about this fight, about Chandler in general, about Ferguson in general. That I did, and I didn't say a bunch of them last night. So if you watch my live stream, believe me, like that wasn't much of a preview for what this video is going to be about. But if you like the content, subscribe and ring the bell. Tell everyone you know. I'm serious though. Subscribe. You'll enjoy yourself. So I'm going to talk about that fight in general first, and then I want to talk about Michael Chandler, and I want to talk about what's next for him and for Tony Ferguson. But here's the deal, dude. Like the first thing that happened. So actually, let me just set the let me set the tone for this fight. Okay. So the fight right before the Chandler and Ferguson fight was the OSP and Shogun fight, which was horrendous. Is horrendous. It's the worst fight on the card. And I'm not look like I am I, I, like I like both those guys. I'm not trying to be a dick. Like I really am not trying to be a dick. Like I understand how challenging it is for like aging fighters who are getting towards the end of their career. And like I like I really feel for them, dude. Like I really do. And I understand what that like. You know, they want to continue fighting when there's not really a reason for them to be fighting. You know, like, I get it, dude. But that fight was not good, dude. Like, that was like, they, they got into like, it was one of those things where they got into the motions of just sparring. Like, they both, and here's the thing. Both of them know they're not fighting for anything. That's, that's why that kind of thing happens. They both know they're not fighting for anything. And, we'll, and that is going to come into play when we talk about the Tony and, and Chandler fight, okay? Okay, these guys are not fighting for anything. They're both at the very tail end. It's just another fight. Like, they're not getting a title shot. They know basically their career's over. This is just kind of like, whatever, you know, we'll do a couple more fights, whatever. And when you're not fighting for anything, then it's easy to fall into a rhythm of just muscle memory sparring, which is what they were doing. OSP's like, oh, I'll just throw the same, you know, up the middle body kick over and over and over and over and over. And then and Shogun will throw the same looping one, two that is never going to land on OSP. He's going to punch it off of his, off his shoulder over and over and over and over and over. And it was terrible. It was a terrible fight. I'm sorry. It was, you know, and it's because they know they're not fighting for anything. And so they're just, they're going through the motions, even if they, you know, they're probably internally like really sad, like, like the underlying bit is they kind of know this is over. So they're sad. They're not excited about it. You know, like it's just a bad fight. And so the place has been booing. They were do like, everyone had their cell phones out. They're like waving, like, Wee! they're basically like, you know, they're making fun of them. The, the, the energy in that place was empty, okay? Like, they were, like it was em like just dead energy. And then Tony and, and Chandler come out, right? And they're both fan favorites, dude. They both got big, big, big welcomes. And I want to tell you the first, like, first big thing for me in watching this was that when Tony came in, okay, like, I know the phenomenon as a fan of like a guy has lost a couple fights and you start looking at him differently, you know, where you're like, um, like he's not that, you know, he's not that scary, you know, like he used to be the scariest and he's not that scary. It, it, like, and I'm saying like, I, this is a thing that I check myself on because I understand how absolutely absurd it is. Like, because the reality is you're talking about one of the best guys in the entire world to ever do it. And when he goes and he's like, like a guy that you'd be that like, is so terrifying to imagine being in the octagon with. And then you go from here to like, and he beats everyone. And then he goes to here and from, but just from changing from this to this, now he loses to everyone in the top 10, right? Just from here to here, right? He could still literally beat every single person in the, in the crowd to death, like in a row, you know, like just line them up, we'll kill, beat them all to death. Like, he's still, but nonetheless, Tony having lost three in a row, that air of like, wow, he's really scary, didn't feel like it was there, right, initially. Then he came out, and then I had this moment, He's when he's in the octagon, he took his stuff off, and I saw the wings tattoo on his back, and I just, like, had this overwhelming, like, holy shit, bro. It's, it's the fucking boogeyman. Like, I got completely overwhelmed with, like, that's Tony Ferguson. Like, I don't know why I had like kind of let my brain get clouded that he got out grappled by Darius and, and, you know, uh, and Charles Oliveira to like, where he's like not a dangerous guy anymore. Cause when I know he's going to this Charles, like he's going to this Michael Chandler fight and this is a completely different ball game. This is going to be a stand up fight, like where he's going to stand in front and they're going to bang. And it, I just was like, Oh my God, dude. 
Like he is the scariest fucking guy in the way. If you know they're gonna, he's gonna stand in front. Of you. I mean, you know, Gaethje obviously picked him apart, but I just like again, I just, it was it was. I'm saying it was awesome. You know, like it was awesome. Where I was like, oh my god, like that's Tony fucking Ferguson. And then Chandler came out, and you could just see like, you know, he's so fired up, dude. Like he's all fire. That guy is all fire, man. And so he comes in, and like you know, look like. I will always be emotionally tied to Chandler's career now because you want to know why? Because A, obviously we know each other and I like him a lot, but like he's the very first person, like the first like big name person to ever say my name publicly anywhere. Like he said, he he quoted me in a Helen Yee interview. And that was the very first time ever. Like that anybody had ever mentioned my channel, like any of the fighters had ever mentioned my channel. And so like, you know, maybe in five years that'll sound silly to people like like a you know mainstream brand but to me it'll always be a big fucking deal a real big deal and so i will always root for him always you know it's just one of those things and and he's also a fucking awesome guy but so he comes out and like and you could just see it was like oh my god this is gonna be this is gonna be fucking unreal you know like this is gonna be unreal and like so the energy you know starts to kind of like it's like you could just feel the anticipation in the place. And everybody saw the fight went. Like, the idea that Tony was washed was quickly erased, dude. Because he's not. He's not. He looked good, dude. He looked really good. Scary. He looked like a very big problem for Michael Chandler in the first half of that round. Because he's long and he was, and he was effectively using his reach. You know, like he's effectively using... Because Chandler is a, he's a short, compact, explosive guy. You know, when he decides he's going to close distance, he does it incredibly fast, right? But he does have to sit on the outside because the other guy can hit him from a distance. If they just, you know, I mean, this is common sense to anybody who knows anything, but like, if they just are standing here and and they both go like this, you know, like Tony can hit Michael and Michael cannot hit Tony, right? So Michael needs to really be very cognizant of controlling distance because he wants to stay out of danger. And then when he's going to get into the danger zone, when he's going to, you know, throw an aggressive strike, he wants to be through that danger zone and on the inside as fast as possible. Like he wants to get through. And Tony was doing a very, very effective job of not allowing him to do that to where when he got close enough, Tony was touching him and he hurt him too. He was throwing fucking heat on those strikes, dude. Like he was throwing power on those strikes more than, more than usual. I, I would say. And he heard him, you know, Chandler was in trouble and Chandler was up against it in this fight. I mean, I know Tony was also, I mean, obviously they're both kind of up against it, but like, but the thing is like for, for Tony, it's different. Like Tony was, is kind of fighting just to like kind of stay on right now. I will say this. If Tony would have beat Michael Chandler by knockout, the impression that he was just fighting to stay on would have evaporated instantly. If he would have like knocked out Chandler, he would have been right back in the mix. Even, even with those three losses, he, right back in the mix. For sure. And I didn't realize that at the time. But now, in hindsight, he would have been. But, you know, he's coming off three losses. He needs to win. Chandler is coming off two losses. Now, I talked about this on the live stream, and I will recap this, okay? So Chandler comes in against Dan Hooker, who was coming off of that Dustin Poirier fight. Like, Dan Hooker was a big prospect then. Like, he was not, this is not like uh, coming off a couple of losses. Like, he, he lost a war to Dustin Poirier. He had just won a war with Paul Felder. He's a, he's a fucking player in the game. And Chandler comes in as a complete unknown and dirt naps him in the first round and then has the greatest post-fight introduction speech ever. Okay? The greatest introduction to a, to the organization ever, without a doubt, in my opinion. For, for a guy in that situation, I'm not talking like Brock Les... Well, actually, Brock lost his first fight anyway. But like... Then he goes into his second fight. He almost now, especially now that we know what Charles is, you know, at the time it was kind of like, it seemed like the consolation prize belt because it was like, well, Connor and Dustin would have been for the belt if they weren't trying to make Khabib, you know, like trying to make him stay so that they could do Connor versus Khabib too or whatever, you know, like all that. So it was kind of like, okay, yeah, they're fighting for the belt, but is it really the belt? And now, you know, it was for the belt, dude. Charles is the fucking man. Like, like time has, has, demonstrated that he's the guy clearly and Chandler came the closest to beating him he 10-8 rounded him and then he got caught because he he thought like this is just my critique obviously you know 
he has incredible striking coaches and Henry Hoof and all them. But like what just my my just as a viewer from home, where the the mistake he seems to make is he is he throws like he's fast enough that he can kind of load up and throw these big, big punches with tremendous power. And it's okay because he's so fast. But sometimes, you know, it's like, whoom. Like if you, you know, if you're just purely trying to generate kinetic energy with a punch that you're throwing, you know, whoom. Like it's like, you know, dropping your shoulder this way so that you can generate more power is the thing that, that you naturally would do. And he does that sometimes. Like his hand drops. And he, so, you know, it's, you know, you're technically, whoom. Right. So he dropped his hand once and he got clipped and he lost. And then he had the greatest three round fight of all time against Justin Gaethje, but he's still coming off two losses. Okay. He has to win. He fucking has to win. And he's still chasing the dragon, dude. I dude, I, I'm, I, Anthony gave me that term and I like, I, I will never stop using it. It's perfect. Chasing the dragon, dude, which is like that. It's like the way of encompassing, like what the, what the, these guys, like what they're really doing, like what's, what's their motivation, you know, like obviously it was announced, uh, you know, Anthony Smith's mom died this weekend, which condolences to him and the family. And that just actually seemed like a relevant thing to say, cause I'm talking about him in general. He's an incredible person, dude. Anthony is like, as I've gotten to know him, he's like a really, really, really good dude. And I like to understand what motivates people, you know? Like my, like people, like, I'm like, we're friends. Like we're friends now. So I like to like understand. I like, just like to understand people. And for him, you know, it's a, it's a way to feed, of course, but he's, he's like, he's chasing the dragon and the dragon is becoming world champion. Like it's, and it's, it's about, it, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate fucking objective as, as a, as a man, not even just as a fight, as a man to be to be in a position where at your size and weight class, you would win in a fair fight against any person on earth, right? And then have the world recognize you as that. Like, that's the fucking dragon. Or, I mean, you know, there's plenty of other things that could kind of, like you could attribute is the same kind of like pursuit in a different sector, but it's just so, it's so straightforward in fighting. Chasing the dragon, dude. And Chandler's chasing the dragon. He's right there, dude. You know, he lost two fights. If he has an impressive outing, he's fucking right there, dude. And he knew that, right? Like, he knew that. And when he gets rattled in the first round, because he got rattled in the first round, he did incredibly. Not only did he, did he survive, he ended up potentially even stealing the round. You know, he shoot. Like, right when someone was sitting with me, he goes... Why doesn't, why doesn't Chandler ever use his wrestling? Right that second, he shot the double leg and took him down. And then he comes out in the second round and has potentially the greatest knockout in the history of the sport. You know, like, I, I know I'm, I'm prone to hyperbolics like that. You know, maybe the greatest knockout in the history of the sport, but I'm fucking serious. Show me a better knockout than that. Real talk, like, and I'm not, like someone said, like, what about Connor versus Aldo? Mm, okay, like that... Given the stakes of that fight it was, you know, but I'm talking like just purely like you're, you're doing a UFC greatest knockouts highlight video, you know, and you're just talking about the knockout. Show me one better than that. Seriously. It's the most devastating knockout I've ever seen. And, and it, you know, those front kick ball of the foot to the chin knockouts are absolutely in, insane. And it's the best one ever by a mile, dude. Tony, I seriously thought Tony was dead, dude. I mean, like, not thought he was dead, but I've been to a lot of shows, and I have seen a lot of guys hurt, you know, but I've never been more concerned about the fighter who got knocked out than I was about Tony last night. Like, I like when, when I watched that replay on the screen, it was like, oh, my God, dude. Like, and then you just look, and he has not moved, like, a millimeter. Like, he's just flat there. You got six people around him. It was like legit concerning that like, I don't know. I thought he was going to get stretched out for sure. But so he wins like that in absolutely spectacular fashion, right? And then, he, you know, he like, t- like Chandler is the quintessential fight game 
He like he has the fucking total package. He's a great fighter. He's a good dude. He's good looking. He's a great speaker. But most of all, he understands the fight business. He understands it. And not only understands it, but he strategizes and he implements great strategy. So like it's it's one thing to understand the strategy. It's another it's, or it's one thing to understand the business. It's another thing to to really understand how to position yourself and strategize. And it's a whole other thing to be able to think through the way to like how to turn your performance into that positioning and then execute it at the time when you have the microphone in front of you. Like you have one chance to do it. One, you know, you get the knockout. That's great. I mean, that's probably the most important thing, but very, very close behind that is now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do now, dude? Here's your moment. Here's the microphone. You memorized it. Like you memorized it. Now you're here. Like you're actually here. There are 30,000 screaming fans. Can you keep your mind sharp? Can you keep it sharp and focused? Can you get through this with the inflection that you practiced? Can you put your soul behind your words? Can you like really fucking exert the passion that you do at home at home you've screamed it a million times you visualize the crowd you get goosebumps thinking about it well it's it's now it's fucking right here you have a microphone in front of you this is your moment this moment right now will dictate potentially potentially dictate the the trajectory of your career which is and you're chasing the dragon that's what he's doing here he's been very clear about that he wanted to go to the ufc to test himself against the best he wanted to see if he could become the champion. That's why he's here. Okay, like, yeah, he makes money. Obviously, he's a well-paid guy. But that's not his motivation. His motivation is the dragon. Like, he wants to be the champion. He wanted to, or he, or in all honesty, he wanted to test himself against the best. And so what he does on the microphone at that moment is fucking critical, dude. It's not a small deal. It's not like, you know, well, he got the knockout, you know, his post speech or whatever. Critical. Because now we're talking about the best Guys, the I'm talking the best fight game guys. Connor, okay. I honestly think Michael Chandler. I think Michael Chandler is like I think there's like Chael, Connor, Chandler. I on like I think like, and I'm making them even. Like I think those those three guys might be the best to have ever done it on the microphone. And I really like I'm I would imagine people will push back on that given that Chandler's only been in the UFC for four for four fights. But I don't think that you can, dude. Because he's executed flawlessly in all of them, and especially in the ones when he won, when it was really mattered, like it really fucking matters. If you think that like, no, you know, oh, you could salvage it when you lose. No, 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 You just won. And now you have the chance to write your own ticket, but you have to execute. This is not a, like, I mean, I'll be crystal clear about this. 97% of them fuck it up or don't fuck it up, but they don't, they don't properly capitalize. How many of these guys do you think are actually at home practicing their post-fight speech with the same intensity and focus that they do the fight? Very fucking few, guaranteed. You want to know who did? Michael Chandler. And you want to know why he's going to end up fighting fucking Conor McGregor? Because of that. Because his speech was so on point. The fucking place could have come down, dude. And not only did he nail the speech, he called out, Gaethje because he's like if Gaethje wins that's like he's like I'm saying it's his strategy he's strategizing okay he wants the belt or he wants a money fight okay one of the two he knows that he just had the, one of the greatest fights of all time with Justin Gaethje and Justin Gaethje's fighting for the title so if Justin Gaethje can win the title very very likely that he can talk his way into an immediate title shot if it's Gaethje he knows if it's Oliveira it's a tougher sell you know it's probably Islam Makashev if and even if Gaethje wins it's probably Makashev but he's got an ace up his sleeve because of his fight with Gaethje. And so he plays it, right? He fucking plays it. He doesn't just say, give me a title shot, right? He could have just said, I want a title shot, okay? Well, he's smart, he's smart enough and he's strategic enough to know that, that that's not going to land by itself necessarily. But don't you want to see me fight Justin Gaethje again in a five-round fight? That fucking lands. It's the greatest, one of the greatest fights of all time, the fight of the year last year. Don't you want to see that go five? Guess what that is? That's a fucking title shot for Chandler. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because that's correct positioning. That's fucking 3D chess versus playing checkers, dude. It's my chance for a title shot. I think I've done all the things. Who wants to see me fight for a title? Okay, versus what he did. 
thousand times better. And he knows he's potentially out of position. And so what does he do? He goes, and if not, give me Conor McGregor. Give me that money fight at 170. Fucking brilliant, dude. Brilliant. Want to know why that's brilliant? Because Conor kind of looks like he's going to fight at 170. You know that that's a possibility. So you make sure you're calling. He doesn't care if it's at 55 or 70. He doesn't give a fuck. He'll fight him at 55, obviously, or he'll fight him at 70. What he's doing is I want Conor and I'm removing any blockers. Okay. If he wants to fight at 70, I'll fight him at 70. Okay. I want the title shot. If Gaethje wins, let's do this thing for five. If not, I'll take Connor and I'll fight him at 70. No blockers. That is fucking brilliant fight game. Like, I try, like, if it's seriously, like, when I said, like, that guy's got incredible fight game, like, it's like, I couldn't have fucking written a script to better illustrate, be, like, elite fight game. That. Fucking that, dude. It gets no better than that. The, the total package, the entire performance, fucking 100 out of 100. 100 out of 100. Maybe the fucking, honestly, in terms of like performance, strategy, execution, it, it might honestly be the best performance of all time. Seriously. Seriously. Now, I realize like most people will be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, he, he, it's two guys who just lost multiple fights in a row. And then I'm talking about taking the opportunity that you have and then giving yourself the best opportunity to land either a money shot, a money fight or a title shot, which is everyone's goal. Like you can't, he couldn't have done a better job. Like, like there's not, there is not a world where he does a better job. He gets hurt in the first, he survives, turns it around. The one of the best knockouts of all time. And then does that on the mic. Fucking brilliant, dude. I love this sport, dude. I fucking love it, dude. I love it. I fucking love it. Congratulations, Michael Chandler. Congratulations, Michael Chandler. Just like I told you I was going to do, I bet on Tony Ferguson to dampen the emotional blow in case. I don't give a fuck about that money, man. I've never been happier to lose that bet. Anyway, love you guys. Peace.